and uh, just an absolute pleasure um, and honor to share the stage with so many distinguished speakers and people working on such important um, issues around resilience and, and local economies. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be in the place where my career as a social entrepreneur started. Um, as Ali mentioned, as a recipient of a social entrepreneurship fellowship um, and a deep wilderness um, experience in, in Sun Valley, in a local organization called The Wild Gift, uh, founded by my dear friend and mentor, Bob Jonas. So it's very gratifying to come back here. Um, and I think Amy, the reason Amy um, and Ali wanted me to speak today was to really talk about one example, um, a proven sort of solution to help address some of the ecological and public health concerns surrounding our, our food system. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about the broader context. I think at this point, this audience is very fluent in all the issues facing um, the agricultural system and the importance of sustainable food and um, uh, agriculture. But I uh, just want to set the stage, and then I'm going to talk about our company as a su successful example of resilient, um, sustainable, profitable urban food production. So agriculture has an enormous impact on the natural world. It's the largest consumer of land on the planet. It's the largest consumer of fresh water on the planet. Approximately 70% of the world's fresh water withdrawals go toward agriculture. It's the leading source of global water pollution. We, we heard about the dead zones that are created through agricultural runoff. Um, and it contributes to about 20% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. On top of that, we have several major trends that are expected to put further, or are putting further strain on the glo global food system and um, going to put additional pressure on the environment. One is population growth. As we all know, according to official UN estimates, the population will be 9 billion people by 2050. 70% um, of those will be urban dwellers. So urbanization requires that food, once it's grown, harvested, and packaged, has to be transported great distances to reach urban consumers, which degrades quality, causes environmental impact with that transportation, and ultimately leads to a lot of waste. Uh, public health concerns. Um, poor diets and diet-related diseases are the number one cause of death in this country. And there was a great quote there by Jamie Oliver. 0.8% of deaths are homicides. Diet-related disease deaths are over 60%, but not enough people are talking about it. And food waste. We're just throwing so much of our food away. 50% of the food that we produce in this country is thrown away, which is just a criminal waste of resources, as well as just very unjust to people who are food insecure. So it's kind of doom and gloom. However, we are at a really, really interesting time in food. Investment in agricultural technology and sustainable and natural food is at an all-time high. Policymakers, industrialists, elected officials, academics, entrepreneurs are all putting a lot of emphasis and a lot of effort into finding more sustainable ways to grow and feed our growing population. So within the broad context of sustainable agriculture, there's a subset of that, which is urban agriculture. Now, urban agriculture traditionally has been more community-driven, education-driven, um, a, a gathering place for people um, and communities to come around, great educational aspects. But my partners and I wanted to see if we could do urban agriculture on a commercial scale. Kind of a crazy idea. So that's what we did. We built and designed and built and now operate the state-of-the-art, technologically advanced urban greenhouse facility in the heart of one of the most densest populated and built-up cities in the world, New York City. The thesis was, if we could grow local food consistently and reliably, of a premium quality, and grow it with a small environmental impact, consumers would rally around that. So rather than eating greens and tomatoes that are a week old, that are shipped you know, from California or Mexico, New York, why not? eat a locally produced product that's fresh, healthy, nutritious, and grown with a small environmental footprint. So that's essentially what our, what our company does. We, we design and develop these greenhouses and operate them. Now, New York City doesn't have a lot of arable land, and it doesn't have um, a, lo a lot of space. It's, it's, there's a lot of competing real estate interests. So we started looking at rooftops as this viable alternative. Vastly underutilized space. So finally convinced a building owner after two years to let us lease their rooftop for about 40 years and build this state-of-the-art greenhouse on it. So the enabling technology here is known as controlled environment agriculture. So controlled environment agriculture is a combination of horticultural and engineering techniques that provides for very consistent crop production, production efficiency, and crop quality. Plants are grown in a very secure, safe, healthy way, uh, which can be very cost effective. So we have sensors located all over these greenhouses that are tracking temperature, humidity, light level, CO2, oxygen, a number of other variables. Which, and all that data is fed to a computer control system, which we've programmed with algorithms and proprietary sort of climate recipes to turn equipment on and off to achieve these optimal growing conditions for the plants. It's 
Fancy way of saying these are very coddled, spoiled plants. Okay? They're getting exactly what they need whenever they need it. And as a result, we can grow um, amazing yield in a small footprint. So one acre of greenhouse results in about 30 acres of field production, the equivalency. So that's 29 acres of farmland preservation. That's, that's 10 times less water used in conventional farming. Specifically, we're using a hydroponic growing technique. So that's a solution that we selected because you don't need soil. Uh, we, we dissolve nutrients in the irrigation water that provides the nutrition and the dissolved oxygen and the water to the crops. We recycle all of that irrigation water for reuse. So it's a closed loop system. So it allows us to use about 10 times less water than conventional farming. And as persistent drought becomes more of an issue in places like California, where most of our food comes from, we believe this form of farming is going to have a greater role to play. Now, to solve global food system issues, there's not going to be a panacea silver bullet. And this certainly isn't it. But it's one potential solution. And I think all solutions need to be very much tailored to their unique geographical, economic, social context. And we believe that hyper-local, urban, controlled environment agriculture has a role to play in feeding our cities. So we now have four greenhouse facilities um, across New York City and Chicago. Uh, we grow about 20 million heads of leafy greens uh, per year. I'm serving those local markets. We also have a consumer good, which you'll see in retail stores. We also have a, uh, uh, products that we sell to restaurants, supermarkets, institutional food service providers. Um, this is how the products might be sold. And the reason why retail, retailers really like this is it's a very consistent, reliable supply of fresh local produce. So for instance, during Hurricane Sandy in New York City, Gotham Greens Produce was the only brand of produce available in about 25 supermarkets for three days. Talk about resilience, right? <laughs> Thanks. And if we can grow it under very high standards of food safety and environmental sustainability, consumers will rally around it. Consumers want to support their local economies. They want to spend their dollars closer to home. And they, they don't want to buy their food from sort of anonymous agribusiness that doesn't have a lot of transparency. And consumers have shown this over the years. And because of that, we're working with large national retailers, Target, Amazon, Whole Foods, and then regional and local retailers as well. So we got started in 2009, built our first facility in Brooklyn in 2011. Produce was selling like hotcakes. We couldn't grow it fast enough. So now we subsequently built three more greenhouses and um, are building three more um, over the next 12 months. So our farms are unique. Um, the top left was uh, the first one that we built. You know, sort of represents this innovative, adaptive reuse of urban space, um, provides jobs. The second one on the top right was a really unique project we actually partnered with Whole Foods Market. So this, resemble, this represents a really interesting corporate partnership with, uh, with a real estate developer to be able to actually grow produce at the source of where it's sold. So you know, this notion of food miles really gets converted to food footsteps. So 365 days of the year, produce is brought down in an elevator and put directly onto the shelf. The third project in the bottom left is in an uh, area of Jamaica, Queens. Um, it's about a, a 60,000 square foot greenhouse. Uh, it was inaugurated by Governor Andrew Cuomo um, uh, last year. And then the bottom right corner um, is our first expansion outside of New York City to Chicago, the third largest city in the country, uh, a very cold weather place that you know, the climate doesn't really allow for year-round local food production. So we thought it was a great market to go to. And uh, there's another really interesting corporate real estate partnership with a company called Method Products, which makes eco-friendly soaps and detergents, a San Francisco-based company that wanted to create this lead um, manufacturing plant that really you know, represented 21st century manufacturing and going beyond just um, the very conspicuous things like uh, renewable energy. They wanted to really um, work towards sustainable food. So they're a really, really great partner. Um, we primarily focus on leafy greens, highly, highly perishable food crops that often don't last very long um, in your fridge. Um, so we can harvest 365 days of the year, deliver it to a, a, a customer within 24 hours, and then that affords them like two to three weeks of shelf life. So it really helps out a lot. So um, these aren't ordinary greenhouses, though. Uh, greenhouse um, technology has existed for a long time. It's practiced on a commercial scale in many parts of the world. And that was really important to us. We wanted to use robust technology. Uh, that we could deploy and really provide consumers with a very reliable product. So, but our greenhouses are unique. We have a lot of interesting energy saving and water saving innovations that are unique to our company. So uh, the yields that we get are incredibly high. As I mentioned earlier, we get about 24 to 25 crop turns per year. We can, we can grow a head of lettuce in about 30 days. Out in the field, it takes about 60 days. Um, our greenhouses are 100% powered by renewable electricity. 
either on-site PV or wind, and the balance is purchased through renewable energy credits. As I mentioned, we recycle all of our irrigation water, and we can basically produce 50% more crop than conventional greenhouses with 25% less energy per pound of crop produced. Uh, we're completely pesticide free. We actually use beneficial insects. We release uh, insects, predator insects in our greenhouses to prey on the bad bugs. Um, and we are able to cut out the food miles, the long distance transportation and all the associated emissions that, that, that sort of come with that. And uh, we're able to eliminate all kinds of agricultural runoff as well, which is, which is a leading source of global water pollution. So this is that first project I talked to you about in Brooklyn, um, 15,000 square feet. This is the second one that we did with Whole Foods, which is, which is a really cool project. This is 20,000 square feet. Uh, the third one in Queens, uh, 60,000 feet. And then um, this is 80,000 feet in Chicago. So this represented a, an $8 million investment um, in the south side of Chicago, an area called Pullman, very economically underdeveloped and recently um, uh, d designated as a national historic monument by President Obama given the uh, the, the industrial past there. It was the first company town in America where the Pullman coaches were, um, were made. And we've produced over 50 full-time jobs um, for Southside residents there. So, you know, just some numbers. And this is not, this is, you know, I run the risk of you know, being a little salesy here, but this is more just to demonstrate that even though we're this sort of mission-driven social enterprise, we can also be um, a resilient, sustainable business that makes a compelling investment opportunity as well. So we have 170,000 square feet. We've raised almost $30 million until date, and our revenue growth has been 400% just over this last year. 65% um, compounded annual growth rate. We have about 120, now about 135 full-time employees, um, and we've been, all of our facilities are cash flow positive. So you know, doing good, you know, there's that thing that you can do well by doing good, and this is a perfect example of that. So now that we have a proven model, we're looking to expand outside of the two regions that we're active in. The states in green represent states where our products are available and where we sell. Uh, so the three greenhouses in New York service the New York tri-state area, and then our greenhouse in Chicago services about six Midwestern states. Nebraska is just one store, um, but uh, that's on there nonetheless. So our goal and our vision is to create this network of greenhouses across the country to serve those local markets with fresh local produce, but not feel like a national brand, but really feel like a local brand in those markets. So for example, in New York, our products have New York sounding names. We have the Queens Crisp, we have the Brooklyn Iceberg, we've got the Greenpoint Oak Leaf. Uh, we co-brand with local organizations and partner with food rescue organizations. Um, uh, environmental education um, organizations like uh, Green Bronx Machine or New York Restoration Project. Uh, we work with the state's Department of Agriculture and their Pride of New York program. And it's run by New Yorkers for New Yorkers and people in that area. So it really has a local flair and local sort of partnerships. Um, in the Chicago and the Midwest market, similarly, we've got products like the Chicago Crisp and um, the Windy City Crunch. And we partner with organizations that are active there, like the Kitchen Community, Pilot Light, the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So the idea is to really strengthen, have local partnerships, and to be uh, an authentic, transparent, mission-driven local partner that helps the local economy. Some examples of working with the community, we donate almost a million seedlings a year to community gardens and school gardens across the country, and just the pedagogical value of plants in the classroom, and just the field trips that we host, and seeing uh, underprivileged inner city kids come into our greenhouse and just their mind be blown like how a cucumber grows or how a tomato grows or how a basil plant grows. It's, it's really interesting to see. Um, food insecurity is a major issue so we donate about 1% of the product that we grow gets donated to uh, uh, hunger relief organizations um, that goes to helping feed the food insecure. Um, Unique local marketing collaborations. So in New York, we sell to Shake Shack, or we sell at Yankee Stadium and places like that, and um, so on and so forth. So again, just really important to have strong local economies and um, local partnerships, excuse me. And I'm really, really pleased that, that, that controlled environment agriculture is now taking on many different forms and applications. And we're really proud of the kind of the path that we've helped blaze uh, in this space. Like I said, greenhouse agriculture is not necessarily new, but now there's all these different variations of controlled environment agriculture. The top left is a really unique project that some of you may know. It's called the Vertical Harvest Project in Jackson Hole. 
Um, it's a really strong community supported project that grows local food for that mountain resort community, um, works with underprivileged people and people with disabilities to run the greenhouse, so that's a great example. Uh, people are repurposing shipping containers to grow food. There's examples of uh, restaurants growing their own food. Um, this uh, idea of vertical farming um, is very exciting. It's in its infancy. Um, I was delighted to, to see that it was one of the solutions listed in um, Paul's project's Drawdown 100 Solutions. So the concept of vertical farming is similar to greenhouse agriculture, controlled environment agriculture, but it's actually growing um, in, within a warehouse environment using artificial light where you can control a lot of the variables like a greenhouse, but you could actually grow vertically, really take advantage of vertical space. And we get about a 30x yield per square foot, and the thesis of um, vertical farming is you can get up to 100x yield. So um, unproven, but still a very, very exciting, exciting technology. And um, I'm really happy to be working with um, um, Ali and, and Mayor Jonas here um, in Ketchum to try to work on a greenhouse project um, that can serve the local community here as well. And um, that sort of concludes it. I mean, controlled environment agriculture, like I said, is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all these issues, but it's one, it's one way. It's one solution. And there are challenges. It's a high capital cost requires a great degree of technical skill to operate these facilities. Um, there's regulatory barriers, zoning and things like that, but um, I'm very optimistic that, that, that now that you know, companies like ours have proven this concept, there's probably three dozen companies now around the world working on some variation of, of urban um, commercial scale agriculture. And um, just sort of to, to kind of finish up here and close, I want to come full circle to um, the Wild Gift, that organization that, that really got me started and probably the most defining part of that fellowship was not just the dollars that I received to go on and start my first social enterprise which was a solar PV company but was the experience that I had in the wilderness um, in, in, in the mountains around here and I want to really thank Colin I know he's not here but for what he said yesterday is that the impact that wild nature can have um, in, in resilience and fostering these values of sustainability and resilience so um, I'm very thankful to this community for, for what it's provided me, and um, hopefully we'll have um, a greenhouse in Sun Valley pretty soon. Thank you.